going to continue to to dive through what we've been talking through throughout this month, and we'll continue to talk through um, for for a few more weeks. Just what it truly means to be in community, and this this whole understanding of it's not the same without you. I think that there's a lot of times where where we can be in a in a church, but not just even in a in a church body, but but there's other rooms that we can be in, and we're like, you know, I'm here, but I feel like this would kind of go on without me. Um, the church doesn't work like that. I truly believe that God brings together the people that he calls to be together for such a time as this. And each and every one of us has a part to play, that there's a, a, a vital part. When throughout the New Testament, when we talk about, and Paul talks a lot about the, the church and the unity being a body of Christ, understanding that there's parts of that body that may not be super visible, but if they're not there, you know about it, right? Right? And I think that there's different times where, where we can slip into this, this feeling and this thought process that things would just go on without me. And it's not the same without you. You need to, to be a part of, of what is happening here for us to be who God has called us to be. And I hope, and, and I hope you continue to realize that. I hope that as we continue to, to lean into this, we understand this throughout this, this time, but not just throughout this time and the series that we're in, but throughout the understanding this throughout the time of, of your life in any church setting, that you're there for, for a reason. And we're going to hang out in Acts chapter 2 to get things started today because I love Acts chapter 2 um, because it's the beginning of the church. And a lot of times when we talk about Acts chapter 2, we talk about um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the day of Pentecost and, and tongues of fire. And then there's this incredible message from Peter that's like this, the, literally the most incredible gospel message post-Jesus that anyone has ever preached. And people are like, this is amazing. And people get saved that day and put their faith in Jesus and believe in him. And it's incredible. But I truly believe that so much of what happens in that passage of Scripture happens at the end of the chapter. And we take a lot of time when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which I believe in. Like, pause, hard stop. I believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe in in all of the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that we should desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially that you may prophesy, which is in Scripture. Like, I believe in all of that. But it's not just a person up front, but it's the church body. And what's amazing about the book of Acts is when you get to the end of that chapter, of a chapter two, you start to realize what the church actually look like, looks like and how it functions. Because the church is not just a really good day with an incredible evangelist, right? That's a really good day. And if that's what the, the plan was, then the rest of the book of Acts would be just following Peter around at his different, different uh, messages that he would preach, which there was a few of those moments. But really what we start to see from that moment on is we start to see this body of believers, random people in random different cities, in different regions of the world, and God moving in the same way through these people. That it's not just about one person. I think it's interesting that Peter's the one that stepped up because Peter's always the one throughout the rest of the Gospels that Jesus is like, oh boy, why? (laughs) Right? He's the one who's constantly sticking his foot in his mouth and Jesus is like, okay, I guess we need to go a little bit deeper because that's not what I meant. Um, But yet Peter steps up in this moment and what we see is the church becoming the church. Starting in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to, and to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and miraculous signs done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the picture of the church. This is what it looked like uh, in the church. It was them coming together and they, they, they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay, still to this moment, know this, we dedicate ourselves to the same teaching. It's not something that's, that's new that we're making up. Like this is, this is the gospel that's here. We hold on to that, believing in Jesus. 
and believing that he is the Messiah and, and, and dedicating ourselves still, committing to living a life that reflects him. Not just hearing about it, but going, how can we be like this? How can we carry this message, not just in the preaching aspect of it, but in living out everything that we do? And with that, we see something incredible. We see them in coming together in fellowship is the word that, that our English Bibles translate. You may have heard the Greek part of it is koinonia. Uh, it's a word, word that gets thrown around more than some of the other Greek words because fellowship really doesn't, doesn't do it a full justice. It really means to share something. They're sharing life together. They're sharing, sharing possessions. They're, they're, they're coming together in all of this. And as we talk about this whole concept of it's not the same without you, we can't do this on our own. True fellowship is all of us sharing with each other. And like, hey, we're going to share in fellowship. We're going to break bread together. We're going we're gonna to invite people into our homes. We're going we're gonna to do life together. We're sharing life together. We share in this. And if if you're not sharing, like I don't know how else to say this nicely, if you're not a part of, of community in the body of Christ, we're not doing New Testament church. It's, it's, it's coming together in fellowship. It's sharing in life together and sharing the things that we have with others and, and them sharing with us and, and having this, this, this fellowship with each other. It says all of the believers were together. And I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of times we look at this and we're like, I like this part. Like, I like breaking bread. Like, I'm totally down to eat at anybody's house. Like, just so you know, I really like food. Don't let the skinny kid fool you. I can, I can eat, all right? We've talked about this before. Many of you, if you know me, I like to run ridiculous miles and amounts of like, so I'm pretty much operating at a caloric deficit the, my entire life. So... I'm down to, if you want to have me over, I'm down to eat. Just saying. I'm not, whatever, okay? That part's fun. The fellowship together, the hanging out together, even coming together in moments like this and, 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 and worshiping together. I think we like that part, that part, but there's a part in there that I think some of us are like, ooh, I'd love to switch over that. And that's the portion where it says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who's in need. I think up until this point, it's pretty easy. I enjoy company. I enjoy the people. I like breaking bread together. I like, I like studying the, the, the teachings of the apostles. Um, even the signs and wonders, like that's pretty cool. Like I'm totally down for all of that. But when it starts to get personal, we start to understand the generosity of our God and what it truly means to be like, hey, we're in this together. Now, I want to dive into a couple of truths in this before we get too far away, like let's, let's look at context. I love context. I love history in all of this, okay? Number one, we don't know how long this lasted. So before we start to think like, hey, this, they all just kind of, this, this communal party where they all just threw everything in a pot um, and, and out of that pot, like what, what all happened? First of all, we don't know how long this lasted. Uh, it could have been, could have been weeks, months, years, we don't know. We do know that in the context of this passage, they're there celebrating the Passover festival. So to do this, a lot of people would have come into Jerusalem. It would have been one of these moments where, where they were supposed to make the journey back to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. And if you lived in Jerusalem, there were laws and rules where you weren't supposed to turn people away. You wanted to make sure everybody was able to be a part of this festival so there would, it would not be abnormal to have strangers literally staying in other people's houses. And in that moment saying, hey, we'll take care of your daily needs, like food, whatever it is that's there. So in this moment, you now have a bunch of people in Jerusalem who aren't from the area. They don't have jobs. Their businesses didn't come with them. They're staying in people's houses. And all of a sudden, they're like, man, we had this incredible encounter with Jesus Christ, with the church that's here, and we just want to know more about it. So they stuck around. And that's the beginning of the church. And they're like, all right, we got 3,000 people. <laughs> Again, I don't know how many of those 3,000 lived in Jerusalem or didn't live in Jerusalem, but we now have a church of 3,000 people that, that we just got to take care of. 
and we're all in this together, so we're leaning in and, and we're doing what we can to make sure that these people can stick around and, and be discipled and we can lean into the teaching and really find out who God is. But in this, it takes sacrifice of, of the people. Again, we don't know how long this lasted. We notice later in the book of Acts as Paul is out doing his missionary journeys that he's taking uh, an offering for the church in Jerusalem because a famine showed up and they were with need there. So at that point, they're probably still not paying for everyone else. So, so we don't know how long this lasted, but we do see a shift in their heart. In this, we realize there's a large festival that's going on. And I think what's amazing about this as the second point of what we see, <clears throat> is they all came for the festival, but they stuck around to live out a life of Christ. And I think it's important for us to understand this is, is while they came and probably made plans to be there for a week, all right, we're gonna be there for the festival, there's gonna be the sacrifices, there's gonna be all the religious things that we're gonna go through that's there, and then we're gonna come home after that. And they had an encounter with Jesus Christ and said, this isn't just a, a festival moment. This is a new life that we will do. This is a new lifestyle. This changes everything. This is a shift in, in not just the moment and the, and the week that we thought we were gonna have, but in a lifestyle, and we need to lock into this. To put it in our own context, what they did is they experienced Jesus and realized this isn't just a Sunday morning Jesus. This is something that we need to lean into. This is an ongoing relationship that we don't just do this in a moment when we're supposed to make plans to go to a festival and get ready for it. This is an everyday moment that we need to lock in and live like this constantly. What we also see um, is that in this shift, Jesus and relationships <clears throat> and living this out became more important than possessions. And this was a massive shift that's portrayed in this passage. This is a moment where, where generosity came from, I know that people are coming to town. If you're living in Jerusalem and you know the rules that are there, you're like, I know people are coming to town. Guys, we gotta save up. <laughs> like, we gotta have the house ready, right? It's a lot easier to have people over to your house when it's all cleaned up because you knew they were coming over for a Thursday night Bible study as opposed to going, oh wait, you're gonna stay here for a month, right? That's a different type of relationship, okay? On the flip side of that, are we willing to let people show up to our houses when we haven't cleaned all day to be ready for them? Do we still have the same attitude about relationship and fellowship and people even if we don't look like we have it all together. Because here's what I know. I live in a family of six people, and there's a time limit on people's welcome when they're staying at our house. And kids go back to being kids, right? And dishes start to stack up, and they aren't done perfectly the way they're supposed to. And in moments like that, is it about being ready for everything, or is it about loving Jesus and loving people more than what's going on, or possessions. And there's this shift that starts to happen. And really, it's a shift that Jesus taught us about. Because if we start talking about being generous, okay? And here's the deal. I'll just I'll throw this out here. Today, we're gonna talk about generosity. We're gonna talk, about, we're gonna talk a little bit about money because Jesus talked about money a lot. But what we noticed in this moment is when Jesus becomes more important than our possessions, there's an outpouring and a growth that we get to walk into and experience, okay? Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says, then Jesus said to his disciples, Who, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I think one of the things that, that we forget about a lot of times with Jesus is Jesus had multiple moments of really hard teaching to his disciples, Multiple moments of saying, like, again, take up your cross. <clears throat> We've now got the cross, and the cross looks like this up here. It's kind of pretty. We have it well lit so that everybody knows that it's there. Or the cross on the front of our building that's super tall so that people can see us. But the cross, as much as we understand it, because we are Christians and we realize that that is, is, is a huge part of, of what it means to follow Jesus, the cross, lest we forget, was a tool of execution. 
And what Jesus turns to his disciples in this moment says, hey, you gotta understand something. If you wanna follow me, you have to execute some flesh. It's not about just getting the, the warm fuzzies. It's not about being around for the miracles. It's not about constantly being around and, and doing the, the feeding the 5,000. Like, man, we didn't have to pay for this, but all of a sudden we got food, right? I think what's so interesting about that story, as much as I love that story and the faith that's in that story and the number of lessons that are in that story, one of my favorite lessons in that story is the day later when Jesus pushes off and goes across the lake. And the crowd follows him around the lake and he turns to the crowd and says, you're not here because of the miracle, you're here because I fed your stomachs. And you're just gonna get hungry again, but it's not about feeding your stomachs once, it's about understanding who I am as the bread of life. But to get to that, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And understanding that there's moments of uncomfortability in our lives of going, man, I don't know what it's like, but we gotta, we gotta, we gotta sell some things so that we can do what God's called us to do. We gotta, we gotta pull some resources so we can do what God has called us to do. There's a mission that's bigger than the however many years that I have on this earth that I need to invest in, not just so that I can sit back and have a really healthy retirement, but so that I can invest in, in what God is doing so that someone else can experience what I've experienced. And there's a shift that happens in the book of Acts when they experience the Holy Spirit and when the people that, that watch them even experience the Holy Spirit, when they experience the, the salvation of Jesus Christ and the freedom that's there, they lean in and they're like, we're in too. What can we do to make sure that the number one thing in our lives is the advancement of this gospel and me living it out instead of just my comfortability. I think we live in a culture right now that one of the biggest things that we have to fight against is we are really, really comfortable. It's really easy for us to, to, to fall back into just taking care of ourselves. And our number one thing is like, all right, am I gonna make sure that I have everything that I need? But the problem with that, and hear me, I'm, I, I battle this too. I am with you. This is not me sitting here preaching at you. This is me like, if I could turn around and have someone else read this to me and me sit up here, be like, That's, I'm with you. But if we can control all of our own needs and take care of all of our own needs, how will we ever experience, as we just talked about, it's not just knowing that God is, but experiencing him. How do we experience Jehovah Jireh, he's our provider? without legitimately setting our life up to need him as our provider. And leaning into moments, instead of trying to, to push away from the moments where it makes us a little bit uncomfortable and it may stretch us a little bit that's there, so we push away from them. Instead, how, why wouldn't we lean into those moments and say, God, I want to experience who you are. I want to experience you as my provider. I want to experience you. I know that you are Jehovah Rapha, you are my healer, but I need to experience you as my healer. What would it be like if we leaned into, because this is what happened, these moments, these people leaned into what he's called them to do. So take up your cross. It may be uncomfortable. You're about to carry your execution with you. That's literally what he's saying. And then we see later that Jesus himself carries his own cross to his crucifixion, willing to do. Can I just pause for a moment? I love that Jesus never asks us to do something that he didn't model, that he did himself. He realizes that it's not easy. He prayed in the garden to the point of bleeding, right? And said, God, if there's any way, let this pass. Take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. I feel like so often when I pray those or I'm in those moments, I'm like, God, I got a couple of options. <laughs> I'm not praying, God, your will, but not mine. I'm like, hey, God, I know your will. I got a couple of other options. Can we throw those in there <laughs> in that moment? But the teaching that Jesus has is whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. The Sermon on the Mount may be one of the... Um, greatest collections of Jesus' teaching. It's found in Matthew chapter uh, five through seven. It's literally just all his words. And in that, he says, Matthew chapter six, 
verses 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you realize that you can train your heart? You can train your desires. You can say, this is what I will do. Even if I'm like, man, this is gonna hurt. There's moments where you're like, you know what? I'm gonna do this because where my treasure is, my heart will also be. Therefore, when we know cognitively where our, where our heart should be, it's then up to us to actually act that out. Not just talk about it, but to do it. This is Jesus in this moment. If you're angry right now, take it up with Jesus, okay? Continues on, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. For your eyes are, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then the light within you, um, uh, and if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Right? So, so now we've got these, these moments that we're seeing. He's like, store up treasures in heaven. Light of the body, or light of, the, uh, of, of your body is, is your eyes. Okay? And then he says something crazy. Like, I feel like if I'm sitting in the crowd, I'm like, who? All right, so we got the treasure part of it, light part of it, because he's the light that's there. Um, he says this, no one can serve two masters. Okay, cool. So like light or dark, right? That's, that's probably where he's going, light or dark. Serve two masters, okay? That's possessions, heart, you know, what's, what's, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And I have to believe this was a curveball to a lot of people in the crowd. Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. Which even in this moment, the word that's here, that one's the money part of it, is actually it's, it's the spirit of money. It's mammon is what Jesus would have said. And he says in this moment, there's a spirit that's in the world, okay? So it's not just, that I don't believe that anyone is like bowing down to their bank account. But what he's speaking to when he talks to the spirit of mammon is there's a spirit in this world that's a spirit of possessions. There's a spirit of pride that says, I've got to make it look like I've got it all together. I've got to make it look like I can take care of myself. I'm a self-made person, right? The problem with being a self-made person is you're no longer dependent on God. And what he's asking us to do, Jesus is asking in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the message that you are projecting, are you projecting a message that says, I am firmly standing on my need for a savior? Or am I firmly standing on my need for me? Am I doing it all on my own? Am I, am I putting all of my eggs in, in the basket of, of mammon, which is literally, it's the spirit of this world. And I think so often when we talk about the church, <clears throat> we love to talk about the fun things. And hear me, I love to talk about the fun things. I'm a really fun person. I just want you guys to know that. I talk to myself all the time. I'm hilarious, all right? I love to talk about the fun things. But so often in scripture, we see Jesus have moments like this with his disciples. Where he's like, hey, here's the deal. If you want to follow me, count the cost. If you want to follow me, take up your cross. If you want to follow me, you have to actually follow. Right? Jesus isn't my co-pilot because I'm not sitting in the front seat. Like it's, it's, that's, not how, that's not how that works. It's not how Jesus ever taught it to be. So the question is, okay, when it comes to generosity and, and, and working through this, because if the Spirit is working inside of you right now, I want you to know that there's, there's resources that we have for you, Okay? The, the number one way for us to train our hearts, and I believe this is biblical, is the tithe. When the Bible talks about the first 10% of our income, 
and giving that back to the church and understanding that when that becomes first and foremost, that the other 90 lives under a blessing and understanding what that truly means. There's incredible resources for that. First of all, let me just say this because we can dive deep into this and we can do an entire series on it and we probably will, okay? But the tithe itself, the very first tithe in scripture is in Genesis chapter 14. The reason that that is important is because that is a tithe that's given by Abram before God gives him the first covenant and changes his name to Abraham. So the tithe precedes the old covenant. And there's people who believe like, oh, that was Old Testament, that was Old Covenant. No, no, no. That's heart and character of God. And even when we see Jesus speak on the tithe, it was something that he didn't have to to speak too long on because everyone understood it. And when he does speak to it, he says, he talks about tithing and then being generous. And he says, I wish that you would do the latter without giving up the former. And in case you're wondering, it's in a passage of scripture where he's taking everything that the old covenant was, this is what I love about Jesus, and adds on to it. In a moment where he says, I didn't come to overthrow the law, I came to fulfill it. And he starts going through the law and he says, here's the deal. The law says you can't kill someone. I say don't even hate. The law says don't commit adultery. I say don't even lust. The law says you should give 10%. I'm saying be generous. And he keeps going through these moments and understanding what it truly means. So, So hear me, in the midst of all of that, if that scares you like crazy, that first 10%, the tithe, There's a resource that we have starting again this fall, a class called Financial Peace University. And can I just please encourage you to take a faith step and start to set your life up the way that God would have you set it up and see what happens when you step into this obedience. One more verse on the tithe, Malachi chapter three. Okay, then we're gonna move on. Malachi chapter three. There's this incredible moment where, where the prophet is speaking to the people and they're, they're trying to figure out why things aren't going right and they're living under a curse. And literally through the prophet Malachi, God says, you are living under a curse because you're stealing from me. And they're like, we're not taking any of your stuff. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, 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 no. What's rightfully mine, you're, you're taking away. The tithe, that first 10% that's mine, you're not giving to me. And because of that, you're not living under the blessing. Church, hear me. And again, I I can't get too far off in this because music's been playing and they're trying to get me off the stage. But hear me. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. When Adam and Eve sinned, curse came upon this earth. And the only way that we aren't living under curse is if we're living under the protection of God. So God was not smiting them to get his money. God doesn't need your money, okay? He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. But what's happening is he's explaining to them through the prophet Malachi, you're living under this curse because you're not living under my protection and my blessing because you're not submitted to me. And in in verse 9, he says this, You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And this is amazing. Listen to God when he says this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Literally, he's like, guys, if we could understand and grasp this moment that when we try really, really hard to take care of ourselves, we're constantly churning. We're never getting ahead. But when we take our hands off the steering wheel and fully submit to him, he becomes our provider. And in case you're wondering, God is a way better provider than I am. And I hope that you understand this. I'm not trying to insult you, but I know for a fact, God is a way better provider than you are too. And there's so much blessing that we could walk into. And I believe that's what this church in Acts chapter two started to experience. They started to experience a blessing that was bigger than financial. Notice the end of that verse, Acts chapter 2, verse 48. 
or 49 that was there, like right at the end, and more were added to their number daily. There was a blessing that went beyond this world. But that's what the church looks like. Hear me, okay? I'll just throw this out there. Church was never meant to live on the backs of one or two really big donors. It never was. Church looks like the book of Acts. It looks like all of us doing our part so that not only none go without need, but also so that we can be the church in the community around us. We can be a blessing to those, again, growing in, in favor of the Lord and favor with all people. Can you imagine the church that we could be in this community if we all just were on board? If we all leaned in? Can you imagine the ministries that could happen? Can you imagine the kids that we could take care of? Can you imagine the the hospitals that we could invest in where, where people need healing? Can you imagine the places that we could go and the things that could happen? But it does not happen without you. It's not the same without you. And it's real easy to believe the lie of the enemy that I don't have a whole lot. This isn't going to do much. The truth is, just like that parable that I referenced before with some loaves and some fish, it doesn't look like a whole lot in a little boy's hands. It didn't even look like a whole lot in the disciples' hands. But in Jesus' hands, it can go way beyond what we could ever think or imagine. What would it be like if we lived like the church in Acts? What would it be like if we took up our cross and said, God, I don't know, this may stretch me a little bit, but I want to experience you as my provider. Can I tell you, worship shifts in moments like that when we experience who he is. We can know cognitively who he is, but when we experience him, that becomes unshakable. That becomes Paul to the church in Corinth going, hey, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words. Please hear me today, church. I hope that you don't start to give because of my words. Don't do that. Literally, scripture says, don't ever give out of fear or persuasion. Like, I'm not here to persuade you. What I am here to inspire you and encourage you to do is to step into a life that God has set up for you and watch what happens. when we experience who he is. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. All across this place. And I just wanna take a minute and pray for us. And we're gonna close a little bit differently. Normally we'll go back into a song. But I really wanna let this resonate. I wanna let the spirit continue to work in our lives. And I want to pray for you, but I want you to join in this prayer just to say, God, what are you calling me to do? So that we can have an experience, a relationship with him. God, I pray right now for each person in this place. God, that we would hear your voice. Jesus, your words are, are just even resonating with me to take up my cross, to do the difficult, to step out in faith. As a kid jumping into a dad's arms, realizing there may be fear, there may be I may be scared, but the joy that happens when you catch me. God, what are you calling us individually to do? God, I pray right now that you then give us the strength and the courage to walk that out. I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to step into that. I realize taking up your cross is not easy. You never said that it would be. But you still called us to do it. 
God, that you would give us the strength and the courage to be the church that you called us to be. God, I pray that you continue to not just pour pour out resources, as you say, but God, that you would pour out vision on this church. Places and opportunities that you would open doors of ministry to be able to invest in, in the people of this community. God, I thank you even right now. I feel led to pray for our Kingdom Builders partners all across the world that we get to invest in ministries that are happening both locally and in globally. God, that in that, that you would continue to give vision so that we could continue to increase, continue to bless, continue to people, show people your love. God, I thank you that in it all, your plan is the church. God, we know that you are the provider. We know that you are the the owner of a cattle on a thousand hills. We know that you have created all of this in the first place. God, that you would continue to, to funnel whatever resources that you see fit, whatever blessings that you see fit to the kingdom builders and the partners and the places that you see. God, let us hear your voice and be stewards of what you have. God, your word says that that the earth and everything in it is yours. Therefore, the parts that you've allowed us to steward, God, let us be good stewards of your resources. We give you all the praise and all the glory for what you're going to do. It's not about us, it's for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 